Hi, my name is Alexandra Dodd. I'm a resident in the psychiatry program at GHS, and over the next 20 to 30 minutes, I'm going to cover three very different and distinct chapters of the DSM-5 that are related because they deal with the sensitive issue of sexual identity and sexual behavior. Here are our objectives for this talk. We're going to name the stages of the normal sexual response cycle. We're going to cover sexual dysfunctions, gender dysphoria, and paraphilic disorders as defined by the DSM-5. And we're going to list some um, possible treatment options for these disorders. And then we're going to review some other psychiatric diagnoses that can affect sexual functioning at the end. So the normal sexual response cycle. Before we talk about everything that can go wrong, let's look at what happens when things go right. Now, Kaplan and Sadek define normal sexual behavior um, as determined by anatomy, physiology, and the culture in which a person lives, as well as their relationships and their developmental experiences throughout the life cycle. It includes the perception of being male or female and private thoughts and behaviors. Normal sexual behavior brings pleasure to oneself and one's partner and involves stimulation of the primary sex organs. Normal sexual behavior is devoid of inappropriate feelings of guilt or anxiety and is not compulsive. Societal understanding of what defines normal sexual behavior is varied from era to era and reflects the culture of the time. Um, so what they're saying here is that sexual behavior is both personal and cultural um, and definitions of it vary through time. So looking at the, the normal sexual response cycle, um, this was developed by Masters and Johnson in the 1960s and has been amended um, and adapted since that time. Um, we move through the stages from desire to arousal, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. And you can see here um, on the y-axis is sexual excitement or tension, and then time on the x-axis. Just some notes on uh, normal behavior, um, asexual behavior, for example, is a lack of attraction. And some people identify as asexual and are in no distress about it. And then we'll talk about a disorder in which people have no, uh, no attraction um, and experience distress as a result of that. So that's an important distinction to make. Masturbation is normal, um, and sexual orientation alone, as defined in the ICD-10, is not to be regarded as a disorder. So now let's talk about um, gender dysphoria. So here's the DSM-5 criteria um, for gender dysphoria. Um, the highlights of this are that there's a um, experienced or expressed gender that is different from one's assigned gender. And this occurs over a six months duration and includes two of these other criteria. A strong desire to be rid of one's um, primary or secondary sex characteristics um, a desire to be the other gender, to be treated as the other gender, and a strong conviction that one has feelings that are typical of another gender. And it's worth noting here that another gender can refer to the other gender, as in male or female, or some alternative gender from one's own assigned gender. And this comes with an associated clinically significant distress or impairment in the social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning in a patient's life. So in gender dysphoria, we can specify um, if it's present with the disorder of sexual development, like congenital adrenal hyperplasia, androgen insensitivity syndrome, and we can specify um, if the patient is post-transition, which means they're living full-time in their desired gender, and have undergone at least one um, cross-sex medical procedure um, or treatment regimen. Uh, these, this can be hormone treatment or gender reassignment surgery, and we have some examples listed here phalloplasty mastectomy. Important to note with the disorders of sex development, um, that this would, in, in some cases, these would be present at birth, um, and there's a tendency to, to as, either assign a gender at birth or um, wait until um, the child has grown up and can choose their own gender, which is a, a newer treatment option. And let's talk about gender dysphoria in children, which is defined a little bit differently, because um, children obviously have different um, behaviors. And most people have a sense of gender by about age three. Um, and the sense of masculinity and femininity develops um, after that time, and it's influenced by the people around us, by culture, and by our physiological cues, such as um, hormones, and body shape, and body size, and features. Um, so in gender dysphoria in children, we have five of these criteria 
In boys, a strong preference for cross-dressing or simulating female attire. In girls, um, a preference for, um, for more masculine clothing. You also see a, a preference of taking um, the, the other gender roles in, in play behaviors and in fantasy play and make-believe. Um, and then a, a preference for another gender's uh, toys, games, and activities that are stereotypically assigned um, to the other gender. And then a, a preference for playmates of the other gender. Um, and a strong dislike of one's sexual anatomy um, as, as the child becomes aware of that. And then associated with clinically significant distress or impairment, um, this time looking at social and school and in other important areas of functioning. And this can even uh, manifest as you know a child just not wanting to go to school um, or not wanting to, to do the things that are typically, um, stereotypically um, assigned to their gender. So let's talk about possible treatment options for gender dysphoria for a minute. Um, the uh, therapy approach consists of supportive psychotherapy with a supportive focus, um, and then hormonal and surgical sex reassignment procedures, which are typically reserved for adults um, and can be something that can be initiated even in primary care at that level, and then referral for um, surgical procedures. So just a, a note to kind of help build successful rapport with patients experiencing gender dysphoria, um, try to use their preferred pronoun. For example, uh, Mr. He and his. We do need to record the biological sex of, of patients as well as their legal name, but we use their preferred name and their preferred pronouns when speaking to them. Note that these patients may have specific education needs in regards to their primary care. For example, a woman undergoing hormone therapy to transition to male will still need pap smears. This can present a challenge um, as a patient may have an aversion to anything traditionally ascribed to their unwanted gender. For example, a um, female to male transitioning patient may be opposed to wearing um, pads. For example, I had a patient who had an, an abscess that we treated in, in primary care clinic. And you know, to, to deal with the drainage, we said just wear um, a pad. And um, this patient was, was very opposed to, to doing that. So just some things to be aware of and to um, be sensitive to. And of course, in this case, you know, beneficence and non-maleficence um, apply. So next, um, we're going to shift gears and talk about sexual dysfunctions. Um, so here's a case. And let's try, to think of, let's try to think of what our diagnosis for this lady would be. A 27-year-old inability to have intercourse tried vaginal penetration, reports her boyfriend was unable to enter. She reports that he does not have erectile dysfunction. The patient experiences desire and is able to orgasm with manual stimulation. Upon questioning, the patient reports a lifelong discomfort with penetration, including when she goes to the gynecologist. In this case, um, genitopelvic pain or penetration disorder. So here are the sexual dysfunctions. The bold ones are the ones that we'll talk about today. And these are disorders that surround the sexual response cycle that we talked about before. Desire, arousal, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. And then with each of these sexual dysfunctions, we're going to specify whether it's lifelong or acquired. So after a period of normal sexual functioning or if it's been a lifelong disturbance. And we're going to specify if it's generalized or if it only occurs in certain situations. And then we'll specify the severity as well for these disorders. Um, so female sexual interest and arousal disorder. Um, this is kind of the flip side of that um, asexualism that we talked about before. This is defined by a reduced interest in sexual activity and reduced excitement and pleasure in activities that would normally be sexually arousing. Um, for this, we do have an FDA-approved treatment, flibanserin, which is a serotonin 1A2A antagonist that's used to treat this um, in premenopausal women. Um, bupropion is also used off-label for sexual arousal disorders. So female orgasmic disorder is our next one, and this is defined by a delay or absent orgasm after normal sexual excitement and normal plateau. Next we'll talk about erectile dysfunction, defined by an inability to achieve erection. Um, the first-line treatment and FDA approved for this is um, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. Um, and then a note on the mechanism of action of these, they increase penile cyclic GMP, increase nitric oxide, lead to vasodilation and erection. 
In addition to the pharmacological treatments, there are also mechanical options available, um, vacuum pumps, rings, surgical insertion um, as well. And then there are some lifestyle changes that are important to think about in patients with erectile dysfunction, including weight loss and smoking cessation. Um, and one of the diagnostic aids that we use is nocturnal penile tumescence, which measures one of the diagnostic aids that we use is nocturnal penile tumescence, which we measure to help differentiate organic from non-organic or psychological causes of erectile dysfunction. This basically just measures whether or not the patient is able to achieve erection while sleeping. The next disorder that we'll talk about is premature ejaculation. The DSM-5 defines this as occurring within one minute of the initiation of sexual intercourse. We have patients who complain of this um, after longer than a minute, so important distinction there. We treat premature ejaculation um, with stop-start technique, um, with SSRIs, paroxetine and sertraline, and those are off-label uses, um, topical anesthetics, and psychotherapy as well. Um, and you can remember this by, you know, paroxetine and sertraline both carry the side effect of delaying ejaculation or people having reduced uh, pleasure in sexual activity. And so um, that's, we're using the side effect to treat this disorder in that case. Next up, here's a list of um, general medical conditions that can cause or be associated with erectile dysfunction. And you can see these, you know, across all organ systems here, um, a lot of contributing factors. Um, Post-surgical complication would be a case um, where you would likely have to consider surgical intervention um, to correct the, the issue. Um, multiple sclerosis, of course, as well. And then diabetes and then any um, heart disease, coronary artery disease as well. So switching gears to, um, to another female disorder, um, genitopelvic pain and penetration disorder, like we had in our case example, and this is, you know, pain experience or inability to achieve penetration. And in this case, somatic causes must be ruled out. So an examination um, by a gynecologist is, is warranted here. Um, and then a term vaginismus is used to refer to the involuntary um, pelvic floor muscle tightening or spasm, making penetration very painful or impossible. Um, and the etiology of this disorder could be nonspecific. Um, or in a lot of cases associated with past trauma or past abuse. Um, so it's important to, to get that history from our patients and to, to, to find out what's going on and how we can help them. So next, let's uh, transition to uh, talk about paraphilic disorders. So paraphilic disorders, um, which I've listed here, um, voyeurism, exhibitionist disorder, um, fraudism, sadomasochism, um, fetishistic disorder, transvestic disorder, and pedophilic disorder. Um, and out of these, um, I think the most difficult to talk about is um, pedophilic disorder. So in general, paraphilic disorders um, consist of a sexually deviant fantasy or impulse that's been expressed behaviorally, and individuals don't respond to stimuli that would normally be considered erotic and only respond to stimuli um, that are specific to their disorder. Um, and this can range from next to normal behavior to behavior that's destructive to the self, to partners, or to the community at large. Um, the DSM-5 lists eight disorders, and this is a small portion of the actual number of para paraphilic disorders that exist. And they were chosen because they're common or they pose a potential harm to self or others. So we'll talk about um, pedophilic disorder. This is defined by a period of um, six months with recurrent, intense, sexually arousing fantasies, urges, and behaviors involving sexual activity with a prepubescent child or children, generally considered 13 years of age or younger. And this can be different from, from legal definitions. Um, and so the individual is at least 16 years of age and at least five years older than the child or children involved. And we specify whether it's exclusively um, attracted to children or non-exclusively, so attracted to both children and adults. And we specify if uh, male or female attraction is present or both, and specify if it's limited to incest. So we do have treatment options for pedophilic disorder, um, which include insight-oriented psychotherapy with a goal of finding insight into the behavior and, of course, changing it. 
We also have aversive conditioning options, um, and this is a behavioral therapy specifically targeted at disrupting the learned abnormal behavior by coupling the impulse with a noxious stimuli. And then there are pharmacologic treatments, um, which are off-label here, anti-androgens, which reduce sexual desire, um, and SSRIs may also play a role. Um, Lupron is one example of a medication that's been, um, been shown, shown promise um, in helping control sexual desire in these patients. So moving on to the other paraphilic disorders, um, the major function of, of human sexual behavior is to assist in bonding, create mutual pleasure and cooperation with a partner to express and enhance love between two people and to procreate. Paraphilic disorders entail divergent behaviors in that those acts involve aggression, victimization, and extreme one-sidedness. So here's a list of paraphilic disorders. Um, and I didn't include the word disorder on all of these, but the um, behavior can be described you know, here as voyeurism, for example, and then to the extent that it interferes with normal functioning would become voyeuristic disorder. So voyeurism, refers to spying on others in private activities and watching other people undress um, or watching other people engage in sexual activity. Exhibitionism is kind of the flip side of that, exposing oneself to other people, uh, particularly to unsuspe unsuspecting people um, like the dog in the cartoon that we showed before. Frauderism refers to rubbing against non-consenting individuals. Um, sexual sadism refers to taking sexual pleasure in inflicting humiliation, bondage, or suffering on others. And masochism um, refers to undergoing humiliation, bondage, or suffering um, with sexual arousal um, as a result. Fetishistic dis disorder encompasses a wide range of disorders in which non-living sexual objects are the focus rather than um, actual genital body parts. And then transvestic disorder refers to sexually arousing cross-dressing. Now all of these refer to um, behavior and resulting sexual arousal that can potentially be accompanied by harm to self or others, a reduction in normal functioning, um, and distress in the individual experiencing this. Now uh, here's a case that's actually um, from NBME that'll kind of um, help us review some other disorders that can impact sexual functioning um, and that relate to sexual behavior. So it's a 17-year-old male who believes that his penis is too large. He's been uncomfortable with his genitals since he underwent puberty four years ago. He's concerned that people will see the bulge of his genitals under his clothing. And although he has never had sexual intercourse, he is afraid that his size will make it difficult or painful for most women. He plays basketball, but no longer undresses in front of teammates or uses public showers. He's not had changes in sleep or appetite, no history of serious illness, and takes no medications, occasionally drinks alcohol, no illicit drug use. He continues to receive good grades in school, fair grades in school, um, normal height and weight, genital development is a Tanner stage 4 on physical exam, no abnormalities. Mental status exam, he's embarrassed and describes his mood as okay which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So we look at our options here. The answer is A, body dysmorphic disorder. Um, so he has a belief, um, a you know, delusional belief about his body um, that, is not, that does not coincide with reality. So next I wanna go through um, a couple examples of ways that sexual behavior can help in your differential diagnosis within psychiatry. Um, and this will be a, a good review as well. So a 75-year-old male with memory loss and increased sexually explicit behavior, what kind of diagnoses would you be thinking of here? You would be thinking about Pick's disease here, frontotemporal dementia. Next up, a 25-year-old female who's brought in by family, hasn't slept in five days, has had increased spending, pressured speech, and eight new sexual partners recently. So you're thinking about a manic episode and bipolar disorder here. And then next up, we have a 33-year-old female with history of unstable relationships, superficial wrist cuts on exam, and impulsive spending habits and impulsive sexual practices. This is something that can be seen in bipolar personality disorder.
So thank you for listening. Um, I have some resources um, here, uh, especially when I call your attention to the DSM-5 clinical case book available online via Open Athens and psychiatryonline.org, um, as well as the, the first aid book for USMLE Step 2 um, can be a good resource for reviewing these disorders um, in preparation for your boards and in preparation for um, providing high-quality patient care. So.